Ladies and gentlemen, welcome this afternoon to the third of four public events in this semester's series, When Worlds Collide, the Study of Religion in an Age of Science. The title of today's event, Buddhism and Science, Tibetan and Zen Buddhist Perspectives. Uh, and your um, dedication to the theme is highly respected on a day when the temptations are much higher to be outdoors. So um, the virtue of your presence is, is noted. Uh, I want to pause to thank the sponsors, the Center for the Study of World Religions, the Boston Theological Institute, and a special grant from Richard Watson, who also endowed the Watson Chair in Science and Religion, which has made it possible for us to bring people together for this event. You should know that uh, this is not just a single event from four to six, but the public part of uh, a meeting that will go on through the weekend involving specialists from around the United States and from Japan engaging in dialogue uh, on relations between Buddhism and science. So this is just the tip of the iceberg of what will be happening this weekend here at Harvard Divinity School. It's a fascinating theme because one has the sense that there are no clear paths and obvious answers. The discussion of Buddhism and science doesn't have that sort of doctrinaire feeling that the discussion of, say, Christianity and science sometimes has. It has the sense of an open exploration Indeed, if you look at what people are saying about the dialogue, you find an incredible diversity of views from those who would say that Buddhism is utterly opposed to science. Science, after all, uh, perpetuates ignorance and uh, is unable to reduce the amount of suffering in the world. People will say that Buddhism complements science in particular respects. People will say that Buddhism harmonizes with science in a way that, say, Christianity can never do Christianity carrying the difficulties of a creator God and supernatural miracles, and that Buddhism doesn't bring that freight to the discussion with science. And then you'll find people making even stronger view and intriguing views, claiming, for example, that Buddhism represents a unique type of science, a sort of science of mind, far from being incompatible, actually offering its own form of science, uh, with thousands of years of empirical history to back it up. And finally, the very strong view of Paul Karras and others that Buddhism is the religion of science, the religion of science. In that broad spectrum of views, we launch our discussion today, and it's my particular pleasure to be able to introduce Professor Don Swear, the director of the Center for the Study of World Religions here at Harvard Divinity School, to moderate the afternoon. John. Thanks very much, uh, Professor Clayton. It's a pleasure to be here and welcome all of you here on behalf of the Center for the Study of World Religions, uh, which is just across the street. It's a very low uh, two-story building and so you, with a very discreet sign in the front. So uh, if you haven't observed it, uh, you know, please do. And if you're here for the weekend, as I hope you are, that you will avail your, yourself of the opportunity of, uh, of, of going across the street and, and, and looking at us. Uh, in the old days when it was founded, which was 46 years ago, it got, it got the uh, nickname of God's Motel, but I think <laughs> in this uh, pluralistic environment in which we, which we live today, you know, it would now have to be called Buddha's Motel and uh, Muhammad's Motel, as <laughs> whatever. At any rate, uh, we have, I think, played a very important role at Harvard in terms of the development of the teaching of world religions at the Divinity School. And uh, I think uh, I'm very proud to be associated with the center. I've only been here now in my third year. I want to just make a few introductory comments about our two speakers. Uh, we're very, very fortunate to, to have Professor George Dreyfus, uh, who is a professor of religion at Williams College. Uh, his important, has done many important uh, writings and books that I'll mention in just a minute. Uh, Professor Dreyfus also has the distinction of uh, having been a Tibetan monk in the Buddhist tradition for many years, uh, studying at some of the most important Buddhist monastic institutions in India, including the famous Sara Monastery. Uh, he actually then became the first Westerner to obtain the degree of Geshe Lamapa, the highest degree or rank of Geshe offering in the Gelug Academies. Um, 
his work, as I've mentioned, is multifold and manifold uh, in the areas of Buddhist philosophy, uh, Buddhist scholasticism and monasticism, uh, and in more popular protective deity cults uh, and uh, in areas of nationalism and identity. Uh, his best known books are probably Recognizing Reality, Dharmakirti's Philosophy and its Tibetan Interpreters, and more recently, The Sound of Two Hand Clapping, The Education of a Tibetan Buddhist Monk. And in regard to that last book, uh, which has been very well reviewed, let me just share with you a couple of comments about the book. A remarkable tour de force, uh, George Dreyfus merges personal memoir and outstanding scholarship to draw us into the intellectual life of the Tibetan monastic college. And in so doing, he transforms forever our understanding of education and the cultivation of reason in traditional and pre-modern societies. If you read no other book on Tibetan Buddhism, immerse yourself in this one and applaud. How many of us who have written books on Buddhism have had that kind of a review? Surely, George, it must have been a close friend. <laughs> Never <believe it. laughs> um, it is a particular pleasure for me to make a few remarks about Professor uh, Eshin Nishimura or Nishimura Sensei. Uh, I was very fortunate to have met uh, Nishimura Sensei when I went to Kyoto in 1967, uh, 40 years ago, uh, to have met him and to have had the pleasure of working with him, uh, of spending time with him at Hanazono Buddhist University, uh, making a visit uh, in those days to his home and small Zen temple in the middle of some rice paddies outside of Kyoto. Um, Professor Eshin Nishimura uh, was the uh, recently retired president, or is the recently retired president of Hanazono University uh, in Kyoto. Uh, he served as president from 2001 to 2005. Hanazono was founded as, in a sense, the flagship university of the Japanese Rinzai School of Zen Buddhism. Uh, Nishimura Sensei is a Zen priest. He's a leading scholar of the philosophical tradition in the West that is perhaps best known as the Kyoto School. Uh, and he has contributed significantly to the dialogue between Zen and Western religion and philosophy. Um, I was, after meeting uh, Nishimura Sensei in Kyoto in 1967, uh, I invited him to Oberlin College, where I was teaching at the time. And uh, Oberlin had just inaugurated a January term. And uh, so with uh, Nishimura Sensei and a meditation, a Theravada meditation teacher from Kyoto, we designed a meditation workshop. And uh, I th think about half the people uh, in that particular workshop uh, have spent now time in Japan. Uh, they've gone on to be specialists in Japanese Buddhism and Tibetan Buddhism. Uh, so it had a profound influence on their, on their lives. Uh, Professor Nishimura, uh, trained as a Zen monk under Zenke Shibayama, and after he earned his PhD from Kyoto University under the guidance of Dr. Shinichi Samatsu, uh, who was an eminent Zen scholar practitioner, uh, he then uh, has gone on to this very, very distinguished career uh, in Japan, uh, studying with other uh, distinguished Zen philosophers, Keiji Nishitani, uh, who many people regard as the founder or certainly one of the founders of the Kyoto School. Uh, Professor Nishimura taught at Hanazono for over 30 years before he became uh, president. Uh, and at the same time, he has been the abbot of Ko Fukuji, uh, the Ko Fukuji Monastery uh, in, in Kyoto. So he's led a very, had a very distinguished and led a very, very distinguished career uh, among his writings uh, in English um, is, a, is a delightful volume that I would urge, uh, urge you to look at, uh, the title of which is Unsui, A Diary of Zen Monastic Life, uh, in which uh, Nishimura Sensei wrote the commentary uh, to a series of 97 watercolors that were painted by Gehi Sato. Uh, and if you want an unusual introduction to Zen and a delightful 
delightfully humorous introduction to Zen monastic life, I would urge you to look at that book. So it's a great privilege for me to introduce both Professor Dreyfus uh, and Professor Nishimura uh, to you, and I look forward, as I'm sure you do, to their remarks. George? Uh, thank you, Don Swerer, for this uh, glowing introduction. After such an introduction, I can only fail the expectations that have been created. So it's a mixed blessing, but still, thank you. Uh, and thanks for the organizer, Professor Clayton, to invite me. I must confess that I was rather surprised to being invited since I consider myself uh, on belonging to what I would call the skeptical side of this, uh, on this question on Buddhism and science. So I, 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 now, I, I, though skeptical, I am not entirely negative. I find the topic intriguing, but also I find it at times quite uncomfortable. The source of my discomfort, I think, is easy to understand, and it's something what I would call the metaphysical temptation, that this kind of discussion seems to almost invariably lead to. Uh, and in this metaphysical temptation, what seems to be often the case is that people uh, start to use parts of science to justify their metaphysical beliefs. And Christians do this, Buddhists do this, everybody do it. The move, I think, is disarmingly simple uh, and is based on uh, uh, some, some uh, rather... Uh, as what I will consider really questionable premise, something like Buddhism is true, science is true, hence they must somehow uh, coincide or something like that. And it, it strikes me that in doing that, uh, 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 people are, are, are often using quite uh, opportunistically part of science the Big Bang Theory, the evolution theory, quantum mechanics, whatever, to justify whatever metaphysic they are committed to. Uh, I think the move is, uh, appears to many people to be quite compelling, and uh, I think it's quite understandable, given the authority of science. Uh, and it's very tempting, given that authority, for people to harness this the kind of prestige of science or the social authority it has to uh, support one's tradition. Now, I, I think in the uh, uh, Buddhist context, we, this is a very general remark and basically illustrate my basic stand towards, or my basic diffidence towards this kind of enterprise. Uh, in the case of Buddhism, I think uh, there, uh, one can observe a, a similar, similar situation with particular twist. I think uh, uh, to understand the relation between Buddhism and science may be helpful to replace it within the context of the encounter uh, of Buddhism and uh, modernity. And I think this encounter uh, has a couple of dimensions. Uh, I will mention two or three here. This is what I call the complexity of this situation. One dimension, I think, is the, what I would call the religious dimension. That is the fact that Buddhism uh, arrives in a, in a situation uh, in which it is understood as a religion, and a religion is understood in particular ways, uh, uh, which are mostly obviously borrowed from the Christian, if not Protestant, uh, traditions. So I think uh, uh, when we think about the Buddhism science encounter, I think that's a very important dimension to keep in mind, are we talking about Buddhism and science or are we talking about science and religion and counter? And these are two, for me, quite two distinct uh, uh, kind of dialogue and two distinct kind of uh, 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 encounter. And I guess I would say for myself that I have very little to say about the science versus religion, though I, I think I have some interest in the other dimension, the Buddhism uh, science encounter, and the last part of my paper will uh, hopefully illustrate with the kind of interest that I have. The problem here in this kind of configuration, the field in which Buddhism enters, is not so much the question of whether Buddhism is a religion or not, 
but whether the use of the category of religion is a useful way to conceptualize uh, the place of Buddhism in its uh, encounter or relation to science. And that's what struck me as the, uh, one of the important, dimension, the important question to be raised here. Second dimension is the colonial or post-colonial dimension, which I guess is quite obvious but bears to be recalled. The encounter between Buddhism and science does not happen in a level playing field, but it happens in a colonial situation in which Buddhism is in face with the encroachment of uh, Western uh, colonial power, missionaries, and so on. Now, faced with this situation, Buddhists have developed uh, uh, strategies which are uh, uh, well outlined by one of the readings that uh, uh, I suggested to the organizer of this uh, 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 symposium. Now, uh, the, the range of uh, reactions, I think, from uh, the Buddhist side has been, uh, I could roughly categorize them in two uh, camps. And these two camps are far from being exhaustive because I was struck by the impressive range that Professor Clayton uh, 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 suggested. I, I will not talk about the people who reject, uh, who think that uh, well, Buddhism is radically different from science and therefore uh, uh, make this kind of strong separation. Most of the Buddhists, I think, who have related to a question of the relation between science and Buddhism, I think have adopted one of these two uh, strategies. One is identity. The claim is simple. Buddhism is scientific. This claim goes back to something that uh, Professor Swear knows w very well, much better than I do. Uh, the situation in Sri Lanka uh, in the, around the middle of the 19th century when the Buddhists were confronted with the onslaught of missionaries and one of the famous uh, episode in that encounter is the debate in Pandura in 1873 when Gunananda is said to have defeated Da Silva by arguing that it is not Christianity who is progressive and scientific and rational but on the contrary that it is Buddhist because Buddhism does not presuppose a creator, does not presuppose faith into a creator and so on. And so this is a strategy which has been adopted by a number of important Buddhist thinkers Dharmapala, Paul Karras, already mentioned, Jayatilike, and so on, who are arguing that with great success that Buddhism is not like other religions, that it is scientific, or at least fully in accordance with the norm of scientific rationality. So this is what I would call the identity strategy. There is another strategy, uh, which is what I would uh, call the complementarity strategy, which is to say Buddhism and science are not identical, but they are complementary. Uh, and the complementarity can be fought along different uh, lines, but roughly it goes something like science is good as far as the external world is concerned, the material. Uh, Buddhism is good as far as the internal. is something like external science versus inner science. And there are a number of proponents of this view. Uh, Fitz of Capra is obviously quite famous. Uh, other people, Mansfield, the Dalai Lama himself, I think, has a view which uh, can be classified in this way. Now, I have already indicated my suspicion of uh, many of this uh, strategy, which I think are very often defensive and apologetic in nature. But for me, the bigger problem actually is not that, because... Uh, various people do various things, and I think it's unfair to paint them all in one uh, stroke. I think for me, uh, and I speak very personally, uh, for me the problem is, is, is in a way uh, goes much deeper. That is, I, I find it deeply problematic to, to uh, take uh, two areas of human inquiry which are so different and try to kind of step back from these areas and develop a kind of grand metaphysical scheme. I just find this utterly unconvincing. I guess I'm inspired by thinkers such as Montaigne, Nietzsche, Wittgenstein, and maybe Aristotle, uh, if we want to go much further, uh, who believe that basically it's impossible for a human being 
to have to develop a, a, a kind of convincing uh, uh, understanding of this kind of uh, this range of of this dimension. And I think uh, personally, as a modern uh, Westerner interested in Buddhism, I find, and this is my own interpretation, let's, I'm not going to claim any authority, but I find that my understanding of what I take from Madhyamika philosophy, uh, that is the idea of the middle way, emptiness, and so on, uh, basically take me in the same direction, which is that uh, 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 any idea of kind of taking uh, a very different area of inquiry and build some kind of of a, a kind of grand uh, a picture of reality seems to me utterly misguided. Now, when I say misguided, I guess I should correct myself because I think it's, it's maybe not as misguided as I seem to imply, but I think it needs to be understood uh, properly. That is, uh, when human beings try to form image of totality, I think it's important to understand that what they are doing is, uh, has to be understood as some kind of myth-making. It's a kind of mythological dimension. And when I say it's unconvincing, I mean it's unconvincing from this point of view of what I would call a kind of uh, more f- uh, philosophically grounded inquiry. Uh, as myth-making, there is no problem in trying to bring together various areas of inquiry and trying to reach uh, a kind of create some kind of mythology which is more adapted to the modern world. But I think it's important that when we do that, uh, we keep in mind what we're doing. That is, we are kind of letting our imagination uh, uh, go. And as I say, I think it's, uh, it's in a way a good thing. And I think it's in all human beings to a certain extent do that. So I think... There is nothing wrong in doing that. But what I I think is really questionable is the idea that in doing that, we are reaching some kind of super truth. That is, the truth of science and the truth of religion, yes. Now we are sure that we are are on solid uh, bedrock. And that's what I think, uh, what I really find extremely questionable. Because for me, uh, this kind of myth-making, which I find in Capra and many other uh, thinkers, uh, is certainly suggestive, but is uh, to be put from on my, in my own personal estimation at the same level as uh, the myth of the creation of the universe by Prajapati or the sacrifice of the Purusha or the, uh, 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 the uh, narrative of the Genesis and so on. All this for me are, are clearly belong to the mythological dimension and There is nothing wrong about that, but I think it's a serious delusion to think that because one borrows material from science, one has some kind of greater purchase on on reality than uh, 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 this more uh, obviously mythological narrative. Now, uh, 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 so this is the first part of my talk. I think the encounter between Buddhist and science, sorry, uh, has another dimension, but a, a dimension which is much less grand and which is much more grounded into empirical inquiry, and which is why I wanted to make this clear separation between a religion versus science uh, dialogue or some kind of metaphysical conversation and then uh, a more grounded kind of inquiry into a particular topic. And this is actually what has uh, concerns me and what has occupied me uh, uh, to a certain extent, and this is what I've taken part. So I'm going to just share very quickly some ideas that I have about the mind and the self and just indicate what I think is is, is an example of some kind of more grounded inquiry, which is very different from the kind of metaphysical uh, dimension which uh, uh, I, I, I talked about first. So... Um, the work that uh, I sometimes do this is, uh, has to do with ideas of the mind in Buddhist philosophy, and uh, uh, I take some of this idea from what's called the Abhidharma tradition, uh, which is uh, probably the matrix of, of Buddhist philosophy, uh, and uh, which developed gradually in India, and which uh, basically 
uh, appears under the form of extensive list. As you know, probably one of the typical jokes about Buddhism is that it has no God, but it certainly does have lists. And if you like lists, the Abhidharma is uh, one good place to look for them. Now, in the Abhidharma, the mind is conceptualized as a kind of succession of mental stream uh, states, something like uh, William James' uh, uh, mental, uh, f- the flow of consciousness or continuum of consciousness, stream of consciousness, sorry, or something like Husserl, uh, flow of consciousness. So this is the idea. Mind is a succession of mental states that are phenomenologically available, at least in principle. And each of these mental states uh, is composed of two parts, one what I call awareness and the other uh, mental factors. And in the Abhidharma, there are six types of awareness, sometimes eight, five sensory cognition, mental cognition, and the meaning of awareness is awareness presences and discerns an object. Now, awareness... uh, doesn't come uh, isolated, but comes with a number of mental factors which characterize and qualify the object of awareness. And as you see, there are 51 mental factors. I will not go uh, into this. But this is to indicate the spirit of uh, of the Abhidharma, uh, 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 which has, uh, I think, at least two purposes. One is what I call ethical uh, nature of Abhidharma typology, that is, if I were to go back, you can see that one of the uh, key distinctions b- that the Abhidharma is making is distinguish what they call neutral factors. Some of it are uh, omnipresent, that is, they are minimal conditions of cognition. Uh, Others are not necessarily always present. And then what the, the Abhidharma would this call uh, virtuous factors, such as compassion, loving kindness, and so on and then afflictive factors such as desire, anger, ignorance, pride, jealousy, and so on. So it's quite obvious if you look at this uh, uh, division that one of the purpose uh, of the Abhidharma is ethical. And obviously, we, uh, in, the, uh, in the perspective of a, a, a dialogue between this kind of approach and some kind of scientific uh, approach, the question of the role of uh, ethical distinction or the, the, the place of ethics in such a dialogue obviously becomes a difficult or an important uh, question. It's clear that there is a lot of uh, uh, elements in uh, uh, the Buddhist, uh, in the Abhidharma view of the mind, which are actually, I think, of some interest to cognitive scientists and which uh, do uh, interact in interesting way with some of the concerns uh, uh, of cognitive scientists. For example, uh, I think the Abhidharma has some very interesting things to say about the phenomenology of attention. So there are things also, for example, about the place of uh, feelings like pleasant, and unpleasant, neutral uh, in, in, in the cognitive process. So there are a number of very interesting insights that the Abhidharma uh, has, but obviously the goal of Vidame, or one of the goals, is obviously ethical, and this uh, will uh, 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 not necessarily uh, 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 correspond to the way in which uh, the mind is understood in the, in, in the scientific perspective. Now, the there is another purpose to Vyabhidharma, to, and this is what I would like to say a few words more, which is uh, the supporting the central, one of the central tenets of Buddhist philosophy, which is the idea of non-substantiality and dependent arising. Uh, the purpose of Vyabhidharma, one of the purposes of, I mean, one of the purposes, as I say, is to separate mental healthy mental factors for unhealthy mental factors. This is one type of concern. The other type of concern is to analyze the experience that we have into components so as to undermine the idea of a unified self. So the idea of no self is at the core of the Abhidharma. If we go back to this long list, you can see that one, what the Abhidharma is doing is in a way is taking apart what we take to be a unified 
phenomena, which is consciousness, for example, and try to outline the different factors, the different uh, uh, dimensions that uh, any uh, state of consciousness has, so as to take away the idea of a unified self. So this is the other very important concern of the Abhidharma. And this obviously uh, uh, goes together with the idea of dependent arising, that is, uh, the ontology of the Abhidharma is an ontology of events, events which are dynamically related to each other, uh, and uh, uh, this is the famous doctrine of dependent arising, uh, which uh, some people have described as the Buddha's slogan. So uh, uh, I think the two go very well together, obviously. It's clear that the picture of the, Abhidharma, the, picture of the mind that the Abhidharma is suggesting is a, is a picture of many uh, 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 events which uh, succeed, uh, come, come and go, and uh, lead to other mental events, and this is the way in which the, the analysis of these events uh, are, are going to lead to uh, an insight into the idea of no self. Now, a central question in Buddhist philosophy, I think, has been, and uh, it's, it's often a central question in Tibetan Buddhism, it is, uh, what is the self that is being negated by the doctrine of no self? As I say, this is a traditional concern, and my question is, in a way, new me- is there a new means of inquiring into that question? That is, can the, uh, uh, the Buddhism science dialogue, and here I mean science, cognitive science dialogue, bring some light to what Buddhists are talking about when they talk about negating the self? As you can see, this kind of concern that I have uh, are, are very close to uh, are much more limited than the kind of uh, 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 the kind of metaphysical concern, but I think they they are still probably quite interesting, and I think they are. Uh, this is a place, for example, where uh, uh, the Buddhists may have something to say uh, as well. Now, the self among Western thinkers, as you know, there is a well-known opposition between bundle theory of the self, uh, something like Hume's, and versus the ego theory of the self, something like Descartes, Kant, and so on. Now, uh, as I, I indicate, uh, uh, is there any alternative? And this is where I bring uh, uh, one of the people who is uh, very invoke, often invoked by uh, the kind of dialogue that I'm talking about, uh, the kind of Buddhist uh, mind science dialogue, William James. Uh, William James has a very interesting view of the self, which uh, uh, I put here uh, uh, on the slide. This means an empirical aggregate of things objectively known. The eye which knows them cannot itself be an aggregate, neither for psychological purpose need it be considered to be an unchanging metaphysical entity like the soul or a principle like the pure ego viewed out of time. It is a thought at each moment different but appropriative of the latter together with all that the latter called its own. So this is a a really interesting view uh, of the self, which raises a number uh, of questions. The first question is, when we talk about the self, what are we talking? Are we talking metaphysically, or are we talking phenomenologically? And I think that separation is not always made. And uh, I guess if we follow William James, we are going to talk about the self phenomenologically, that is, talk about the sense of the self. And the sense of the self is something like a mechanism of integration and appropriation. And the question, the following question, is at which level does this integrative mechanism or appropriative mechanism work? Or to put it otherwise, how many selves do we have, or how many rather senses of self do we have? Now, there are a huge number of uh, uh, views on that. Some people call about five. Some people call, uh, it goes, I think, up to 21 cents of the self. Uh, so uh, this is obviously kind of a very, very rough uh, 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 dis- discussion, but the discussion uh, which I think helps to make some sense some kind of connection between Buddhist concerns and uh, 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 science uh, uh, concerns that 
cognitive scientists or psychologists or philosophers have. So uh, I distinguish three kinds of self. The extended self, uh, uh, it's we, which, I, which I think uh, uh, most people, uh, most of you are, are well acquainted with. Uh, this is uh, how, uh, for example, Recur, McIntyre, uh, Dennett, and many others have talked about the self. Uh, Dennett talked about the self as a fictional center of narrative gravity. Uh, uh, other people talk about the self as the, the extended self as uh, the answer to the question who I am when I'm thinking about telling the story of the life, the trade, the value endorse, the goal I pursue, and so on. So this is what I could call the extended self, the autobiographical self, socially acquired sense of self. There is another sense of self, uh, which is that now, I, in my estimation, this extended self, sense of self obviously depends on language, on social interaction, and I think uh, uh, there is not much question about that. Uh, there is another sense of self, much more immediate, much more low level, uh, what's called core self by some people. Uh, some, uh, uh, one uh, uh, psychologist says, about the core self, or core self, or core sense of self, provides a point of your orientation. It is what grounds human motivation and organizes our experiential world in accordance with need and wishes, thereby giving ob- object the affordances, the significance for us as obstacles, tool, objects of desire, and the like. Without normal self-affection, the world will be stripped of all the affordances and vectors of concern by which the fabric of normal common sense reality is knitted together into an organized and meaningful whole. So core sense, self is, is, is connected to the way in which the world is organized around us at a very immediate level. Uh, it's also connected with a sense of agency, control, and so on. In Buddhist terms, we can say, call this an innate sense of self. And then finally, there is uh, what I would say uh, the, the idea of the subject, subject of experience, that is a sense of ownership. Some people call it minimal, minimal selfhood, ipsity, and so on. And it's idea of it, when I have an experience, that experience is immediately given to me as being mine, and that I don't need to raise any question whether uh, I have an experience or not. I may be totally deluded as far as the truth of this experience or even the content of this experience, but one thing I am not deluded is that I am uh, the person who uh, 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 feels that experience, whether it's hunger, uh, a perception, thought, whatever it is. Uh, uh, this is what I call this minimal selfhood or subject of experience. Now, if we think about uh, Buddhist arguments for no self, uh, there are a number of arguments where I laid out three typical arguments And I think what interests me particularly is the argument from lack of control. Now, obviously, uh, those of us who are Buddhist scholars know that the uh, relation between arguments and meditative experience or insight practice of meditative practices, particularly practice of insight uh, uh, within the Buddhist context, is actually a complex and quite problematic topic. Now, some approach uh, uh, explicitly uh, follow arguments, a kind of argument that I laid back here. Others are non-discursive, such as uh, uh, many of the contemporary Theravada insight practice. But I would argue that they implement quite closely this argument, and this is the, uh, the quote that I used to support that from one of the leading meditation teachers in the Theravada tradition of the 20th century, um, Azizada, who says, the practitioner of insight further reflect. This is a mass of suffering. Suffering is unavoidable. Arising and disappearing, it is worthless. One cannot stop its process. It is beyond one's power. It takes its natural cause. course. This reflection is in accordance with the commentary. What is painful is not self, not self in the sense of having no core because there is no exercising power over it. So I would argue uh, to go back to my three kinds of self, that uh, uh, what seems to 
be going on is that if we think about these three kinds of self that I laid out, uh, the self as subject seems to be quite untouched by uh, this kind of argument. And I would assume that the goal of meditation is not the deconstruction of the subject of experience, but operates probably at a slightly higher level, that is what I call self at the center of narrativity, which is a clear target, and probably what I call the core self, that is self as center of agency. So I think this is how I would like to connect this Buddhist discussion with some of the concern of cognitive scientists about uh, the self. I think if we look at this different self, I think it's clear that uh, the Abhidharma argument aimed to undermine self as center of narrativity, but what I think is more interesting is that it also seems to undermine the idea of self as center of agency, which obviously raises a very interesting question for Buddhist philosophy understood in relation to cognitive science, that is, if really Buddhism aims to undermine uh, the idea of self as the center of agency, what would then be the model of agency uh, for a person who has reached sufficient insight into uh, uh, the, the uh, uh, into no self. Okay, that's my little spiel about how I one way I think about uh, uh, the uh, uh, dialogue between science and Buddhism. As you can see, this uh, 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 interaction for me has is raised very very important interesting questions. Interesting questions which I think uh, are interesting on both sides. But they raise interesting questions for cognitive science and they also raise interesting questions for Buddhist thinkers, Buddhist scholars. And in a way, what uh, uh, this is, is in a way going back to the uh, kind of age-old art of comparison. Uh, uh, but comparison understood not just as saying like, uh, Hume's view of the self is like Theravada's view of the self, but rather trying to create an interaction between the two sides of the comparison and trying to advance some theoretical concern, ideally on both sides or at least on one side by doing this comparison. So my conclusion, uh, enrichment or synergy, I guess you get my drift, but I am resolutely on the enrichment side and I do not believe very much in synergy. I don't think we're talking about definitely conclusion, but we may be talking about mutual interrogation, new resources to explore ancient questions about the self, maybe uh, ideally new scientific hypothesis, tractable questions, and so on. Thank you very much. Thank you very, very much, uh, Professor Dreyfus, for such a stimulating and well-organized talk. I'm sure there will be lots of questions about this. Uh, Professor Nishimura, would you come to the podium, please? Uh, I should say, then, it's, it's, it's obvious that after the two addresses, uh, we decided we would save our questions until after both of our, our speakers spoke, uh, and then there will be plenty of time for questions afterwards. So. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I'm sorry, I can't speak English like the professor. <laughs> Please enjoy my uh, exotic English. <laughs> I am Eshin Nishimura, 
Japanese Indians and Buddhist priests, a scara on their thought. I live in small Zen temple in the countryside of Shiga Prefecture, the province next to Kyoto City. My prefecture is well known, as it is near the biggest lake in Japan called Biwako, where the ninth international conference of the lake and marsh was held in 3001. In 1961, I found myself working in the woods of Concord, Massachusetts, remembering the name of Ralph Baldo Emerson, who, along with the other transcendentalists, I had heard of in high school. And now, as I reflect more deeply on his work, my admiration for Emerson is heightened, especially when he read from his lecture, Nature. In the woods, we return reason and faith that I feel that nothing can be before me in life, no disgrace, no calamity, which nature cannot repair. Standing on the bare ground, my head burst by the breeze air and up, uplifted into infinite space. All mean egotism vanishes. I, be, I become a transparent eyeball. I am nothing. I see all the current of the universal being circulated through me. I am part of I am part or particle of, of God. It's certain that the power to produce this delight does not re reside rigid in nature, but in man, or in a harmony of both. It's necessary to use this pleasure with great temperance, for nature is not always tricked in holiday attire, but the same thing, same thing which yesterday brazen the perfume. And greeted as for the floric of the nymph is overspread with melancholy today. That's cool. I am deeply attracted to Emerson's understanding of nature as a metaphor for man's spirituality, not God, God himself. And moreover, when he says, egotism vanishes and I became the transparent eyeball. Instead of I have transparent eyes to see nature. I appreciate the demand he makes on humans. According to Emerson, humans have to forget themselves so that only the eye remains. And also, he requires of us the great temperance, temperance to the secret of the nature which is striking human hearts. This carries exactly the same meaning as then text which reads, the eye does not see the eye itself, which means that our ordinary eye is not the true eye to see the reality of the object. Therefore, our eye has to return to the eye itself, where the eye only remains so that the objective world might be released from the human things and return to its home ground. It appears to be a paradox. It's here that I see Emerson's egoless eye as remembering, resembling consciousness of Japanese medieval Zen master Shuho Myocho. 
を話題と告知。フライテス。When I see through my ears, when I see through my ears, listen through my eyes, rain, rain drop is dropping just as it is. There's no any the unreal. Looking at the boundless space through a window on the plane from Japan, I was thinking of the smallness of human existence, which exists only for several decades and soon passed away without knowing anything about this infinite universe. Such a short life span is still comfortable for a human. So far as we enjoy our lives creatively and through arts. As part of this, te-、uh, as part of this task, both religion and science have been driving force to understand the human desire for creativity throughout history. Towards the end of the last century, the well known historian Dr. Arnold Toynbee summarized the 20th century as a century of rapid advancement of natural science and creative encounter of world religions. But Toynbee's admir- admiration regarding the brilliant advance of the 20th century does not seem to be universally true. Human beings are now faces With a potential turning point in scientific progress, where science, scientific advance this rises, raises as many questions as they resolve. He writes All science has one aim, namely to find the theory of nature. We have theories. Of races of function, but scarcely yet a remote approach to an idea of creation. We are now so far from, now so far from the road to truth that religious teachers dispute and hate each other. And speculative men are esteemed unsound and fibrous. But to a sound judgment, the most abstract truth is the most practical. Century of deep consideration. In this respect, I would like to express my deep agreement with Professor Clayton's decision to entitle this gathering a consultation rather than a conference. One reason for such warning might be that this specific gathering is aimed at, aiming at thinking together on an issue that will be important for future generations. It's not to be merely a series of discussions regarding the relation between science and religion on an academic level. Another reason to endorse the use of the term consultation is that Clayton's term indicates a willingness to listen to the Buddhist opinion about this issue instead of, instead of or alongside traditional Western religions. The fact that you are organizing this gathering And that Dr. Clayton has structured it in the, way of, in the way he has already shown your enthusiasm to learn something from the Buddhism of the Far East. This emboldens me to respond to his generous invitation in kind, and therefore, from my own religious perspective. Personally, I feel that this consultation gives us the opportunity to break through 
the impasse of the present human situation. It gives us the chance to see it from a different angle, from a new perspective, one that is far different from the Western religious institution. For this very reason, I intend to put more stress upon the teaching of Buddhism. I hope it doesn't sound like propaganda for my own religion. For the purpose of the making my talk to be more clear and objective, I intended to quote many sentences from the writing of Kyoto School philosophers who are mainly standing on their Zen experience. Needless to say, the 21st century does not need to be, nor can it, can it be, an age of further steps in human technological achievement. It needs to be a century where human beings step and uh, stop their headlong rush ahead, plant their feet firmly, and, and, uh, and, and as an ancient Chinese proverb wisely says, stop working to return to oneself. I deeply believe, therefore, that the 21st century should be a century of deep considering, as Martin Heidegger said in his later years. I need more. <laughs> there are two kinds of thinking, both of which are correct and not necessary. Those two are calculating thinking and reflective thinking. The way of deep reflective thinking is a way which is open for everybody by his own way and within himself, his limits. Why is this so? Because it is the essence, it is the essence of a human being to think or to reflect himself. Therefore, we do not need to fly to the high beyond when we think ourselves. It's already enough to stay beside the thing which is close to ourselves. Think of things existing most closely to us. What is existing close to us is, namely, the thing with which everybody is concerned here and now. Here means this corner of the each of our home ground. And now means in this moment of this contemporary world. Oh. As Heidegger points out, human beings in our time truly seem to be running away from the deep thinking, which is the essential nature of human existence. To revise this tendency, some people want to recover what is missing in their thinking, to recover Heidegger's reflective thinking. Thus they occasionally turn their gaze towards Buddhism, which teaches us to have a right view in order to investigate the reality of the world. Despair of human existence. In order to investigate this path towards the right thinking, we shall begin with the most fundamental teaching of the Buddha, who taught the following in his first speech to his five followers, right after his great awareness of reality. The world is full of suffering, birth is suffering, old age is suffering, sickness and death are suffering. To meet a man, whom one hates is suffering. To be separated from the beloved one is suffering. To be vainly struggling to satisfy one's need is suffering. Satisfy one's need is suffering. In fact, 
life that is not free from desire and passion is always involved with distress. This is called the truth of suffering. In order to enter into a state where there is no desire and no suffering, one must follow a certain path, the stage of this noble eightfold path, a right view, right thought, right speech, right behavior, right livelihood, right effort, right mindfulness, and right concentration. This is called the truth of the noble path to the cessation of the cause of suffering. Among these practices, right investigation through right concentration would be the most necessary to the contemporary human being who constantly forget to stop working in order to patiently watch a thing carefully. To think is a fundamental condition of man's existence. Cogito ergo sum, ergo sum, as a French philosopher Descartes said, to think does not require any specific religious belief, but it does belong to each person as his or her ability. Furthermore, it is Buddha who followed such a human ability and pursued its implication for one's life. Through his deep thinking, under the bow tree, he discovered the root of human existence, that is suffering, and also the root of suffering, that is ignorance. ignorance. Human beings today have now begun to grasp the various situation of our own existence, but we are still not aware of how to think deeply about such situation. Dr. Shin Ichi Hisamatsu, a leading Zen scholar of the Kyoto School, who was my teacher and the guiding influence during my college life, discusses the finite of human existence and the ignorance of modern humankind about, about our own reality. He writes as follows. The structure of humankind itself is based upon antinomy. This is the core reason why humankind cannot overcome this limit of destiny by itself. It's an authentic way of knowing the limit of humankind that we be aware of ourselves as a limited being. Therefore, it's a matter of ignorance that we don't know of the limit of our existence. In this sense, modern humankind is like the ignorance, ignorant who is not aware of his own limits. Cool. Samat's indication reminds me a saying of Kierkegaard that's to be able to despair is a strong point of man, Kierkegaard say. To be able to despair is a strong point of man. Interestingly, I was assisted in coming to these insights Insight through my study of the great Danish philosopher Zeren Kierkegaard during my college years. Through this study, I was shaken by the structure of his theological thinking, especially when he placed great stress upon Socratic subjectivity as a precondition for standing in front of God, this severe. According to Kierkegaard, authentic belief in Jesus Christ, that is the truth, is only possible when a believer is subjective in the sense of sin. That is, having the sensation of untruth. One must become aware of one finitude, 
ピニティウド。It true that without a believer's subjectivity, no religion would be possible, no matter how different the various forms of faith are from each other. And yet, in addition, Kierkegaard says that the despair of finitude is nothing but the content of man's subjectivity. Kierkegaard's structure of Christian belief is quite similar to Zen attitude towards the reality. In Zen Buddhism, a master brings his disciple to great doubt or des despair by refusing his question and pushing him back onto himself instead. In this way, disciple loses the ordinary self-ego. This state of non-self or unconscious self is a necessary precondition pre for finding an absolute self existing beyond the ordinary self. Unless human breaks through this great mass of doubt, they will never be able to reach their final freedom. Buddhist view of man. In Zen Buddhism, to which I belong, a Zen master tried to release his disciple from the bondage of the ordinary ego self and to let her realize her original true self. Lin Chi, a founder of Chinese Rinzai Zen, preaches to his disciple as follows. On your lamp of red flesh is a true man without rank, who is always going in and out of the face, face of every one of you. Those who have not yet proved him, look, look. Lin Chi here impatiently encourages students to look to their true selves. According to Lin Chi, one's true self exists neither inside nor outside of their physical body, but goes in and out through their sensuous organ at each moment of daily life. That is to say, such a true self exists neither in the physical body nor somewhere out of the body. But then, where does it exist? It is this true self, understood as neither existing inside or outside of body, which the Zen meditation seeks to explore. There are many well-known episodes of how Zen monks realize the original self that transcend the physical limits in each monk's daily life. Example such as listening to the sound of a temple bell, smelling the fragrance of an apricot tree, looking at one's reflection on the water, having one's leg broken by the slamming of, the, of a door from, the, from a master, and so on. Reveal the various ways in which Zen Buddhism explains the discovery of one's own self, true self. All these hap happen happenings occur not in still meditation, but in the motion of daily life. The true self is almost always discovered in the course of regular everyday experience. This is the reason why Dr. Keiji Nishitani, a Kyoto school philosopher of Zen Buddhism, defines religion as a real self-awareness of reality by itself. And thus, a Zen master teaches that there is no reality other than this true self, which is often realized when the doubtful self created through the Zen practice meet with nature through daily experience. In a similar vein, the Zen master Dogen, a founder of Japanese Soto Zen Buddhism, wrote a poem entitled Original Self as follows. In spring, self is flowers. In summer, moon. In autumn, little cuckoo. 
in winter, in coldness of snow. Given the theme of our consultation, it is crucial to note that in Zen Buddhism, one's true self is witnessed by and through surrounding nature, or, in other words, nature is a content of non-self or true self. Nature and science. It is well known that French philosopher René Descartes, the father of modern philosophy, cut the medieval theologic, theological world view into two parts, namely the world of less cogitance, which has its essence in thought or consciousness, and that of less ex extensor, which has its essence in physical existence. Because of this division, the Descartes' dualistic world view was established, divided into matter and ego subjectivity, or substance of man, and human being to stand in opposition to the nature that surrounds humankind. But in so doing, humans became a solitary island floating in the dead ocean of things. Things. As a result, science began to be able to treat and manipulate nature, mani manipulate nature as it likes, so that it has advanced in amazing speed up to the present. The ob object of science is thoroughly, thoroughly a world of death, world of the dead which is moved by a series of laws of nature from which science itself cannot be free. This attitude has continued in varying degrees to the present day. In the medieval age and before, the green planet Earth used to be like a unique greenhouse protected from the dead nature of the universe. But, but since the beginning of the modern era, brought in by Descartes, humans have begun to break apart the precious grass of our greenhouse through science and technology. Our planet now came to stand for a dead, uh, a dead aspect of nature. In this way, this earth of living beings is now tending toward the world of death. In the near future, living beings may no longer be able to pros prosper here anymore, and only mechanical beings and the most resilient of organisms may be capable of surviving our failure of technological creation. Today, in the midst of the increasing knowledge of science, we may come to see that while the debt to science is increasing, unfortunately human unhappiness is also increasing. With such a series of global situations in hand, scientists themselves, along with philosophers and many, many others, have begun to think especially about the limit of science. Needless to say, even a scientist is a human being, no matter how she, as an objective scientist, is committed to a picture of nature, she is still a person who, who lives in the emotional and physical world of her own daily life. Even inside, even inside the laboratory, a scientist keeps her religiosity, even if she remains a committed a faced, a faced. Even a medieval, uh, go on, uh, excuse, even a medieval doctor can be a patient, and if his doctor told him frankly that his disease is cancer, he might be shocked by the doctor's pronouncement, even though he had asked 
his doctor to tell him the truth. Even in the age of science, we remain physical and mental create, creatures who live within more dimensions than simply, simply the science. And so it is true that nature is a mysterious mass even for the scientist, thereby opening up an infinite possibility by and for scientists. It is this infinite possibility space that must force us all to begin to think of the limits of science. Exam examining, examining religion. If time come, to please make a stop. Over? Already over? Ten minutes more. Five minutes. Examining religion. Switching from the above discussion, I would like to now change my focus from the science of religion. Science, it is true that our current global crisis is not merely the fault of science. It results also from the shallow understanding of human existence, for which I posit religion is responsible. In this respect, I clearly for favor the interpretation that states that the human being is a basic preoccupation of religion. I skip the quotation. At the same time, Nishitani writes that traditional religion is lacking the understanding of the human existence of death, uh, human experience of death. He writes, for the purpose of the having mutual relationship with modern science, religion itself has to re-examine its world view. The theological world view, as I said before, fundamentally, fundamentally a kind of greenhouse, even a world view understanding the world as a God's order, still fundamentally contains a view of this world as a living house of man. Such a world view still oppose the human, or too human, to the inhuman world, which science reveals. It is characteristic of such a world view, world view to investigate the world as a circumstances of living being from the inside. In ordinary religion, in order, ordinary, or, uh, ordinary religion, God has been sought to be a bottomless fountain of all living being. Therefore, the dead, dead phase of the universe is nothing but the remaining shade. I find a sort of irony in Nishtan's writing. That is to say, the phase of death, which is a fundamental essence hidden within religion, has now ironically been aware awakened by science instead. It is, true, it is truly ironic that human beings who have thus far proceeded by means of the unlimited impulse of instinct are now meeting with the deeply nihilistic part of human existence, which is somehow fundamentally connected to the essence of religion. In fact, science and religion have their common root in the reality of death, as Nishitan is writing in the following. Up until now, religions have tended to put the emphasis exclusively on the aspect of life. Soul has been viewed only from the side of life. Notions of uh, personality and spirit, too, have been based on this aspect of life. And yet, from the very outset, life is at once with death. This means that all living things, just there, can be seen under the form of death. Here, I would like to suggest that we interpret science schematically, similar to the outline, 
I have given a Buddha. And similar also to work of Heidegger. Not only should science doubt its ability to judge the subject of realm, but it should also admit the possibility that opening up such realms may illuminate another reality. I would like to quote here again from Heidegger's Gerassenheit, especially his call for letting being be. As Heidegger has realized, humankind now has to take its hand away from nature to run an openness to the hidden dimension of nature so that nature will reveal its secrets. For this purpose, humanity must work toward a deep and continual thinking filled with spirit. Buddhism calls such an openness, openness of sunyata, which is a basic precondition for having good relation with nature. Only in this way will nature also be released from human bondage and return to its native state. Nishitani writes out. We'll skip. Here Nishitani points toward the transcendental world, which belongs neither to the scientific world view nor to the religious world view. Although simultaneously both view belongs to transcendental world to the sense of reality. Aditi Suzuki explains in a different way, but I will skip. The Buddhist wisdom that Suzuki here discussion is what can be called the human wisdom of self-awareness. It is that which is entirely different from objective knowledge. The Hope for a new century. Let me conclude my talk now with my hope for a new direction within science and religion. Though it is still the accept, exception rather than the rule, contemporary science seems to be moving in new direction. Issues such as global warming, air pollution, unclear, uh, nuclear energy, information technology, biotechnological te biotechnology, ecosystem studies, and so on, are becoming the main topics of, of our day. And it is none other than scientists themselves who are now afraid of the awful situation that we have brought about who are living us. Scientists are now facing death and the possible demise of our planet, realities which have been essentially hidden in science itself. Scientists today also seem to be seeking other possibilities of human happiness than can be created or eliminated by science. It's astonishing to see my, uh, many Japanese scientists today so interested in Buddhism. They are gathering in Raja number of four lectures on Buddhism that are being sponsored by other scientists themselves. For, for example, it is now not uncommon for a medical doctor to seek and raise awareness about what death means, such that medical science is now including the issue of death within itself. This has increasingly led to the host of new discussion within medical ethics, which are gathered in depth and scope than ever before. I'm sorry, I lost the last page. So, fortunately, time has come. <laughs> I hope you followed. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Nishimura Sensei. Uh, I'm not sure that many of us have uh, thought about the common roots of science and religion in terms of the concept of the reality of death, and that might be an interesting uh, question to explore. Uh, 
Uh, we now have time for discussion, and I would invite uh, our two speakers, uh, Professor Dreyfus uh, and Professor Nishimura, if you would mind coming up to the table. And uh, I will moderate uh, only in that I will recognize questions, and then if you would direct your question to either one or the other or both of the speakers. So please. And, and would you please speak up so everyone can hear? Mm -hmm. I mean, as you're probably aware, this is a deep question in Buddhist philosophy, in fact, the relation between the doctrine of no-self and ethics um, is thought to be one of the most central questions of Buddhist philosophy, and a lot of the Abhidharma developments have, been, have revolved around this question, particularly the question of karma and how karma can be compatible with an idea of no-self. So this is not exactly uh, a question which is unknown within the Buddhist tradition. Now, uh, when you said the destruction of the self, I'm not sure that this is actually... Negation, Well, yeah, or even negation. I'm not sure actually how to think about it, because if you think in terms of, of cognitive science, and if you think that human beings, for example, do need to have agency, uh, do, do we really think that Buddhist meditation is aimed at negating uh, the sense of self which is involved in agency? I don't actually. I probably don't think so too. But uh, obviously, uh, this is where we reach, in a way, a, a, a new territory, because what we're talking about is not so much in terms of negation, but more in terms of transformation, right? How this sense of self, from a Buddhist perspective, needs to be transformed. And what is no self, then? What is no self? Well, no self, you know, is this idea that the self is a construction, right? And in a way, uh, you can see this idea of, uh, of a self as a construction, uh, being pursued by the Abhidharma, and I guess from a modern perspective, a Buddhist might be interested in the way in which cognitive science uh, do seem to sh give a similar picture of the construction of the self. So I, I think uh, 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 indeed uh, uh, what we're talking about is more uh, the way understanding, from my perspective, understanding how the self is constructed, rather than uh, and just a metaphysical idea whether there is a self or not. That seems to me to be the more interesting question. And then, obviously, the further question, which is actually what would be really interesting, is to know 
in which sense is the sense of agency modified by extensive practice of meditation? And I have no idea how to answer this kind of question. I mean, uh, you expect Buddhism to have... Uh, I mean, Buddhists take... Uh, 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 the uh, professor has talked about subjectivity and the central role of subjectivity, and it's very clear that in Buddhism, the exploration of subjectivity uh, is a central topic. And there is also a key distinction between what you could call egocentric subjectivity and enlightened subjectivity. That's a distinction which is at the heart uh, of Buddhist uh, discussion. But when it, Buddhism deals with uh, egocentric subjectivity, I think it has a lot to contribute in terms of a phenomenology of various aspects of egocentric subjectivity. What is more surprising is that it has actually relatively little to say, as far as I am aware, of what an enlightened subjectivity would look like in terms of a more precise phenomenology. It's really good on the phenomenology of the ordinary egocentric subjectivity, but when it gets to enlightened subjectivity, which is what you expect the Buddhist to be strong at, actually... The, the accounts are much less uh, 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 sustained or rich than uh, one would hope for. And uh, I, I, if, if my colleagues in Buddhist studies uh, want to correct me, I would be delighted because I've been thinking about uh, this: how, how, what, what would the phenomenology of non-egocentric subjectivity look like? Uh, I, I would be delighted to hear more about that because uh, I don't have too many ideas in this field. But uh, I guess this is, I think, the, the way I would like to think about it. Do any of uh, Professor Dreyfus's, uh, Dreyfus's uh, colleagues in Buddhist studies want to respond to that? <laughs> Enlightened subjectivity, John? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. issue uh, in, in looking at agency from a light point of view. Another factor is just that it seems to be one assumption in the tradition that th- there are limits on how well we can describe a Buddhist awareness because a Buddhist awareness is um, uh, unconstrained, unlimited, spontaneous um, expression of precisely the perspective Yeah, no, I, I think there are suggestions. Uh, I, I think uh, they are hard to translate into a phenomenology of what a non-egocentric subjectivity would look like. Uh, yeah, and maybe there are good reasons for uh, Still, there, there is, I think, the need. I think you're quite right to think about tantric uh, and maybe Janet wants to say things about that too. 
as, as, a, as a way to think about enlightened subjectivity, because I think that may offer uh, better ways to explore uh, uh, this topic, which are, and, and when I was talking about the non-egocentric subjectivity, well, one can obviously think about the Buddha, but there are stages in between, right? And so there is a, presumably a, a, a number of uh, possibilities or possible models, but uh, uh, we can perhaps come back to it. Do you want to? All right, Janet, please, <laughs> Janet, Professor Jatso, please. Yeah, it's constructed. Yeah, I mean, we're not... Constru construction doesn't mean... There, could I just... I, I want to get into this, too. And <laughs> we're, 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 going, we're on a roll here. Uh, a, a very important part of Professor Gyatso's work, particularly in, and some of the rest of us, is... This raises the question of really what kind of, 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 of texts or literary genre does one bring to bear to these kinds of questions uh, so that narrative texts, uh, close reading of narrative texts, bring out perhaps a, a richness and diversity of a way of kind of answering these kinds of questions. Or what kind of, if we want to think more philosophically and doctrinally, what are the range of philosophical or doc, doc, doctrinal questions that are then evoked or brought into the discourse uh, so uh, these kinds of questions open up such a panorama of, uh, of, of issues, very fruitful. Does anyone else, we, I want to uh, allow different kinds of questions as well, but uh, please. Uh -huh. Buddhism, the last stages, in the last stages of Mahayana Buddhism. 
This is a very rich, a very rich philosophical question. Maybe uh, George, would you mind sort of re re perhaps reframing it as, I, as you specifically will respond to that? Yeah, uh, I, I think you're quite right. The, the Abhidharma does imply a certain type of philosophy. Basically, the philosophy is something like uh, a certain version of the two truth in which uh, extended entities such as the self uh, is, uh, are analyzed in terms of components, dharmas, right? Now, uh, you're also right that uh, Nagarjuna's work is a critique of the Abhidharma. I think it's quite true. Uh, but if you look at the way in which uh, Indian and Tibetan Buddhist traditions, which is the kind of traditions I'm really aware of, have kind of put together uh, uh, the, the, their own version of Buddhist tradition, it appears to me quite clear that though Abhidharma is being critiqued, it is a basic element in this tradition. I was educated in a tradition which is Mayana and which is uh, uh, Madhyamika, and yet most of the categories I was trained to use, or many, not most, but many of the categories I was trained to use were straightforwardly borrowed from the Abhidharma. So I think uh, uh, though Madhyamika is a critique of the Abhidharma, it certainly is not the case that uh, the Abhidharma has been abandoned. And in fact, uh, well, you know, Buddhist scholars would say, well, the Abhidharma is a good presentation of conventional truth and, and something like that in the Madhyamika sense of the word now. But uh, uh, the reality is that the categories of the Abhidharma are formative of the Buddhist discourse. I am aware of it is Indian and Tibetan Buddhist discourse. Uh, there is no discussion of, uh, for example, all the epistemological tradition of Dharma Kirti without understanding its background in Abhidharma. So I think Abhidharma is, is a very, very uh, for important foundation of Indian and Tibetan Buddhist traditions. Now, I have make absolutely no claim about East Asian uh, Buddhist tradition about which I know very little, but as far as I know, as far as the traditions I am acquainted with, though they may be critiquing aspects of the Abhidharma, I think the basic framework is still uh, at work. And so I think it's still an important tool of inquiry. And actually, I think the Abhidharma, because it's, well, you know, the Abhidharma is basically a bunch of lists, and these lists are kind of difficult to use. They, are not, uh, they don't yield immediate insight, but actually I think in the context of a Buddhist science dialogue, the Abhidharma uh, does offer some interesting resource. I think there's a question here first, and then over here. Yes, please. Yeah, I, I just want to comment on, on the first part of your talk, uh, Professor Dreyfus. I, I find you a bit severe about you know, <laughs> complementarity views of, um, of science and, and Buddhism. Um, you know, I completely agree that, of course, uh, uh, you know, one should not use one to support the other and mix the genre. Uh, that's absolutely true. I mean, Buddhism has existed for 2,500 years, and, and science was born in the 17th century. It changes constantly as well. I mean, that's a characteristic of science. And so, I mean, one should not use one to justify the other, and of course, you know, whether the, the, the earth goes around the sun, the sun goes around the earth, does not have any, uh, you know, consequences on, on the Buddhist side at all, and, and science works perfectly well without any uh, purification of uh, spirituality. I'm a practicing scientist and astrophysicist, and I know many of my colleagues that are completely atheists, so mm -hmm. they, they do their work very well. But I, I think it's very, very interesting you know that you know that I, I do be believe that science and and and, 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 and spiritual they are two windows that look at the same reality. Uh, you know, and so it's interesting to see whether you know two systems that are based on a coherent thought, based on empirical evidence, uh, are, are coherent or not. So to me, you know, I'm, I'm Vietnamese born, raised in Buddhist tradition, and I'm an you know uh, practicing astro astrophysicist. So to me, it's very interesting to, to me to see, for instance, that you know the concept of impermanence, you know, that that so now that you know there's all this concept of evolution in this 20th century uh, in the universe, uh, evolution, Darwinian, all this is came from the 20th century, which is completely different, now, in fact, from the scientific cosmological scientific view before. For instance, uh, you know, 
you say up to the 50s, uh, 60s, 1960s even, you know, 40 years ago, uh, some people thought the universe was completely uh, always, mm -hmm. what is called a steady state, you know, that do not change it on the average. But now it's the concept of Big Bang, where everything is changing, evolving. And to me, it's very, very interesting to see that, you know, I mean, uh, Buddhism emphasizes that the concept of impermanence very, very, uh, you know, very, very well. Then the concept of interdependence, you know, the uh, particle physics also, uh, things are changing constantly, you know, particles, uh, you know, I mean, we don't see them, in the uh, those uh, neutrinos go through your body right now, you know, the, the electron go through the table, and things look still, but, you know, everything is changing, moving, and to me, it's interesting to me as a scientist uh, to see this view, not contradicted by, by the view of Buddhism. So it's, to me, it's two, you know, windows that are complementary to the world. We may not get to the super truth, you know, ultimate truth, like you, you call it, but it's, to me, it's interesting that, you know, they are coherent. Could, 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 I, could I ask you just a, 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 perhaps a short response? Uh, you, you, I think, illustrate with your comments one of uh, Professor Dreyfus's you know, types or categories, which is very interesting. What's the significance of that affinity for you uh, as a scientist, raised, uh, raised as a Buddhist, uh, an astrophysicist? So you approach this with this kind of background. And you find the the affinity or the complementarity yeah, interest so inter is is it is it just but it, is is that all it is is that is is it just uh, intellectually interesting that they're complement that they're well, complementary I mean, it, it does in my mind it does say that you know maybe we are approaching mm -hmm. you know some kind of uh, reality you know but maybe it's not the ultimate reality I don't think that we'll ever get it you know I mean even as a scientist think it's limited to science even so uh, uh, but. Uh, but you know, there's, you know, maybe there's some truth to it, you know, quote unquote, so to me. And then, of course, there's tests also that, that you can do. For instance, you know, uh, in, in cosmology, for instance, um, Buddhism does not admit the, the concept of creator. So that means, you know, they cannot create a, a, a universe, actually, low with a creator, that kind of thing. So one of the cosmological pop, uh, model is a uh, psychic model, you know, where it's a series of big bang and big crunches. And that we can measure. And measure the rate of expansion of the universe, the, the amount of that energy, that matter, and so on, and test that. So there's tests that can that that can, that can be done, that kind of thing. So you know, I mean, it does influence, I guess, my thinking as a scientist. Okay, so thank you very much. There was a question over here. Uh, I think you all heard the question. Uh, do uh, Western science and Buddhism start from sort of different, do they have different starting points, different preconceptions here? Do uh, well, my first, the first part of my talk was meant to be provocative. So uh, um, I was hoping that at least I would get some reactions because I was meant to be, to, to provoke. Uh, I, I do agree that I am too harsh for the metaphysical imagination. Uh, I guess hearing uh, my uh, co-presenter presentation, I realized that, uh, I guess another way of saying what I was saying is that in a way, we, if we want to talk about uh, uh, this kind of grand metaphysical picture, uh, maybe we're best left, uh, we, we better leave the, room, the, the, the podium to poets rather than to 
uh, philosophers or people who do kind of tight analysis. And I am not a poet. I am not much of a poet. You probably have already seen that. So uh, uh, that, for me, yes, there is a room for metaphysical imagination. But I think it's important. I, I guess I would disagree with the claim that uh, when we do that, uh, we 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 we're getting something like closer to some kind of uh, final truth. In, in a way, I think all myth making is equally inadequate to truth, and therefore talking of which one is closer and which one is further is just the wrong kind of question to ask. Uh, and uh, but think about that. Okay, you you talk about impermanence. Fine. If you're a Christian, what are you going to look? Evolution, Big Bang, the fact that there is a beginning, oh, this is a sign that there is a creator. Now, one does not appear to me to be more legitimate or less legitimate to the other. And my, my own personal conclusion, informed by Montaigne and uh, uh, other thinker, Montaigne was uh, the key thinker in my for my father, so obviously I have a complicated relation with Montaigne. <laughs> but uh, I, I do come with, uh, as an older man to come to realize the wisdom of Montaigne in saying that we don't have access to being. And that therefore, you know, one metaphysical imagination is probably as good as the other one. And this is not to say that they don't have their role, because I think when you, when we do this kind of putting together a grand picture. We do something which is actually useful for us. But I think it struck me as really dangerous to think that uh, when we do that, we are kind of getting kind of closer to some kind of ultimate truth because other people will put together a different picture. And that picture has to me as much legitimacy as any other picture because they're equally selective in the kind of uh, aspects of science that they, they focus on. Uh, I am glad uh, Professor Clayton uh, has a hand up, and I must, I must recognize him, but I just want to sneak in a comment <laughs> before that. And I, I'm very glad that uh, uh, Professor Dravis mentioned, uh, if you will, the, 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 the more poetic, if you will, uh, mm -hmm. uh, way of thinking about these kinds of issues that uh, Nishimura Sensei represented. I mean, one of the uh, to, just to sort of frame this in ter terms of a particular question, which neither of you need to answer at this point because uh, Philip does need to have his, his time here. Uh, but to think about the concept uh, of the nature of the self in terms of these epidemic categories that Professor Dreyfus outlined for us, and then think of the kind of language that Eshin Nishimura uh, mentioned, the, the, the self that is neither inside or outside the physical body, the self that is encountered in the mundane world in the fragrance of the plum tree or the sound of the, of the temple bell. And, and, you know, what do we do with these? Uh, how, do we, how, do we, how do we put those in dialogue? But, uh, Philip, uh, please. I would like uh, Professor Nishimura to have the opportunity to respond to the charge of metaphysics that you've repeated in the talk and, and afterward. I have read the whole text of Nishimura Sensei's talk. Uh, it has, it might sound like a deeply metaphysical talk. There are long quotations from Kierkegaard, from Heidegger, uh, from Nishitani, from Nishida, um, and many thinkers who, whose language sounds metaphysical. Yet I walk away from the talk with the feeling that it is not about metaphysics at all, not about ultimate being at all. And I wonder if that's a, a point that Professor Nishimura would like to comment on. Have you offered us a metaphysical talk? Where are the Buddha denied metaphysics in the beginning? Uh, we don't want to think of something out of our world. Uh, we are always with surrounding world, but always we are standing opposed to the nature of our world. Especially thinking that human being uh, is the center of the world. Perspectively, we are seeing that means uh, missing. We are missing the reality of the each things of the world because we are seeing from the window of the small castle of self ego, perspectively. So, so then said 
it's not good. To know the reality of the world of thing, each thing, uh, we have to shut our window of self-ego. Uh, <clears throat> well, uh, I am completely anti-metaphysical, I'm so sorry. <laughs> 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 well, well, uh, you are talking about non-self or soul. Uh, uh, yeah, I'm now getting 73 years old, and now I realize what then thought, really thought. Well, uh, when I say I am or myself or so, uh, this is not real self at all. This is a, this a sense of self, consciousness of self, we made by ourselves, looking at the mirror. No? So when, when I am asked, when you are asked, who are you, you can explain. But this, uh, the self which is explained by words is entirely not the real self. Our self is uh, before our words. When we sleep, when we sleep in bed, we don't know ourselves. But the real is mass of self, physical mass of self exists on bed. We realize after we get up. Uh, this mass of self is most important. So, uh, as I said, I doesn't see I. I see I see the many things, but I cannot I cannot see I self. We cannot see myself. We can we don't understand myself. But this is unknown of self is real self. Uh, <coughs> I don't, I know that there are many wrong history about the argument between religion and science throughout the history. They are always antagonistic to each other. And sometimes medieval religion is overcome the science, or modern age science overcome religion, and so on. So on. If we do the same thing in this contemporary world, I think that's meaningless. Just a repeat of our discussion of the history. I think there's no uh, possibility to shake hand science and religion at all. No matter how we discuss about this kind of thing here, uh, science, science does not stop their progress. I always uh, discuss with science, uh, medical doc doctor or scientist or so on and so on in, the, in this kind of conference. And we agree each other very nicely, friendly. My friend said, oh, I agree with the other scientist. But after a uh, conference, there's, there's a party, reception party. That's a real symposium. At that time, he, my friend, went away from France, opposed to me as a scientist. No, no, you know, coming across each other. But in this place, it's okay. But in reality, the science think they are good. Religious people think thinking different way. But, so I think. There's no way, there's no possibility to come across each other's science or religion today. But Borsa began to think in something, their fault. So, uh, religion, religious people must go down deeply, as well as science go down to more deeply, so that they can, so, can, so that they found a you know, common level where they meet each other. What is it? This common level is the, the reality of despair of human limits, human limits. But science and religion in our his past history always thinking 
the possibility of a human being. Both are started from the same basement, limitness, limitness of a human being. Therefore, they wanted to severe in, in religion. And uh, they found the limitness of human beings so that they found some tools or machine, you know. We cannot touch the seal, so we found a ladder to climb up and uh, we invent, invented the planes, seeing, imitating birds, so on, so on. So, science and religion both started from the awareness of human limitness, human limitness. So no need to discussing each other. But since modern time, they separated. I I am quite critical about modern humanism. Humanism is very uh, hubris. Modern humanism has stand on the hubris of human being. So religion itself a modern uh, humanized. Religion itself is humanized for getting the weakness or limitness of uh, human beings. Today, religion seems to be, especially Western religion, seems to be very humanistic. When they talk about, about neighbor, neighbor love, neighboring love, hmm? how is it possible to, to love the neighboring without knowing himself? But um, I, I was taught that we have to know the, our limitness of our existence, despair of our existence. That is realized by the Zen meditation. That's the best way to stop working and think myself, ourself, deeply, deeply, deep, until we forget the existence of myself. So that being aware of weakness of self, For the first time, we know the weak, weakness or limitness of the other, our nature. There we see the compassion, real compassion. That comes from the awareness of limitance, weakness of existence, of all living existence. But Humanism always think human being is okay, it's the best one, eh, to control the others. But, but I don't think human being is only such a strong being. Uh, I regret that our... Yeah, I was forgetting this is a Western world. <laughs> <laughs> I regret that our time, I'm afraid, is past, in fact. There are some other hands, and I know there are more questions. Uh, and we still haven't pressed uh, Nishimura Sensei on the common root of science and religion and the reality of death. There are many questions, but please come back tomorrow. Uh, there's going to be, and I'm sorry? Said, uh, wine and cheese reception in the brown room now. Thank you. Wine and cheese, and uh, wine will indeed raise more questions, so uh, please join us.